Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, our teacher Moshe, is called Raya Mehemna, the uh, shepherd of faith, or the trusted shepherd. The role of the tzaddik, of the shepherd of the generation, and in, ca- in, the, in the case of Moshe, the shepherd of all generations, the role of such a tzaddik in the world cannot be over, the importance of it cannot be overstated. We find in the Midrash, where the passing away of Moshe is described, we find um, how crucial, how important, how indispensable Moshe's presence was to the world itself, to the existence of the world. We find also how precious and how indispensable the tzaddik is to the Jews of the generation. And finally, we see how God needs the tzaddik to be present on earth and how the loss of the tzaddik is a tragedy on all levels. And that's why it is compared to the destruction of the temple or the destruction of the altar. Here are some of the descriptions, some of the stories that are related in the Midrash, in Midrash Rabbah, concerning the passing away of Moshe. The last parsha, the last section of Torah is called V'zeis HaBrocha. And this is the blessing. And the verse goes on to say, this is the blessing that Moshe, the man of God, gave to the children of Israel before he, before he died. The Medrash wants to explain what is the significance of this blessing that Moshe gave. And so it begins with an explanation of the statement that Shlomo HaMelech makes where he says, Many daughters have done valiantly, but you have surpassed them all. And the Medrash says that this, uh, among many ways of understanding that verse, we can also understand it to refer to Moshe. Many daughters did well, meaning many tzaddikim did well, but you, Moshe, surpassed them all. And how do we visualize this? How do we see this? So the Midrash says, Adam says to Moshe, I am greater than you because I was created in God's image. As it says, and God created man in his image. Moshe says to Adam, but I have surpassed you because the godliness that God gave you, you eventually lost. God created him immortal, but because he sinned, he became mortal. So he lost some aspect of his godliness that was given to him. Whereas I, Moshe says, the godliness that was given to me may not have been as great as the godliness given to you, but I surpass you because what was given to me I never lost. As the Torah says concerning Moshe, that even on his last day, the last day of his life, he was not at all diminished, and the light that shone from his face had not departed. Noyach says to Moshe, I am greater than you. I survived the generation of the flood. Meaning to say, I survived not only physically, but also spiritually. So Moshe says, But I have surpassed you, because you survived only by yourself, and you weren't able to save any of the people of your generation. Whereas I survived with my generation, because when God was angry at the Jews for having made the golden calf and threatened to destroy them, Moshe was able to prevail on God to forgive them, and and the punishment was was never was never given. So Moshe says, if you have two captains go down going out to sea, one returns 
without his ship, and the other returns with his ship, who gets the praise? Obviously, the one who came back with his ship. So Moshe says, although it is greater to have survived that generation of the flood, but to have survived by yourself and not have saved the generation is like the, is like the captain who comes back without his ship. And certainly, coming back with the ship deserves more praise. Then Avraham says to Moshe, I am greater than you because I fed people uh, on the road, wayfarers. We know that uh, Avraham had a tent that had four doors, a door on every side of the tent so that people, travelers, could come directly into the home without having to go around. And they could notice immediately that the door is open and that they're welcome. So Avraham excelled in his hospitality and he fed people on the road, travelers. So Moshe says, I surpassed you because you fed people in the city, in in civilization. But I fed people in the desert, in a place where there is no food available at all. Because the manna, the mon that fell from heaven, came in the merit and in, in the schus of Moshe. So Moshe brought food to the people in the desert. Yitzchak says to Moshe, I am greater than you, because when I was stretched out on the altar, and I looked up, I saw the Shekhinah, I saw the Divine Presence. So Moshe says, but I surpassed you, because you saw the Shekhinah, and it made you blind, in your later years. Whereas I spoke to God face to face many times and I did not go blind from it. I was able to absorb it and to contain it. We're told that when Yitzchak was on the altar in the Akedah, the angels were very upset and they began to cry and plead on behalf of Yitzchak's life. And one of those tears from an angel fell into Yitzchak's eyes and that caused him to go blind in his, in his later years. So, so Moshe says, I trans, I surpassed you. I'm on a higher level because my body was able to see godliness without being hurt or damaged by it. Yaakov says to Moshe, I am greater than you because I wrestled with an angel and I won. So Moshe says, but I surpassed you because you wrestled with an angel when an angel came down to earth, to your turf, to your home. I went up to heaven to receive the Torah and the angels wouldn't allow me to take the Torah from heaven. They wanted to keep it for themselves. And I had to wrestle with them on their turf, in their world. And I was victorious, and I brought the Torah down to earth. And so concerning all of this, Shloim HaMelech says, many daughters did well, did valiantly, but you surpassed them all. And therefore, when the children of Israel need a blessing, it should be Moshe who gives the blessing since he's the greatest of them all. And that's why this parsha begins, and this is the blessing that Moshe gave. Now, obviously, when we're studying Midrash, and uh, we read that Adam said to Moshe, Moshe said to Adam, this is not describing an actual conversation. It, it, rather, it is giving um, a visual form to the idea, to the concept. What does Adam stand for? What does Adam's existence say? And then what does Moshe's existence or or behavior say? So we're not talking about an actual conversation. We're talking about what their actions speak of. Because their actions and their lives speak for themselves. 
The Medrash then describes the conversation between Moshe and God. God came to Moshe and said, Your time has come to die, and you will not cross the Jordan. You will not come into the promised land, into the holy land. Moshe was not pleased with this, and he pleaded, he prayed to be allowed to live and go into the into the Holy Land, into Israel. 515 prayers. He was, he was quite determined. At first, when Moshe heard that he was going to die, he didn't take it seriously. He thought to himself, there were a number of occasions where the Jewish people sinned serious, grievous sins. But as soon as I pleaded with God to forgive them, God did forgive them. So I, who have never sinned in my life, certainly when I plead with God, he will certainly change his mind and allow me to live. And so God had to decree Moshe's death. There had to be a special decree that Moshe die, even though there is already a decree that all human beings must die. Moshe argued as follows. Moshe said, there's there's a law in Torah, there's a commandment that says that if you hire a worker and and he's working uh, by the day, then you have to pay him at the end of the day and not let the night go by without having paid him. It's one of the 613 commandments. So Moshe said to God, how much work and how much effort did I, uh, did I put into the Jewish people to teach them to believe in your name? How much effort, how much work, how much heartache did I invest in the people to teach them to love you? I assumed that just as I saw them in their time of need, when they were first developing and growing into a holy people, that I would certainly also see them in their time of reward when they will have um, attained the goodness and the godliness and the and the holiness to receive their reward and to have their good time when they would come to the promised land. And now you're telling me that their good time has arrived and that they are, they are now worthy as a result of my efforts. They are now worthy to go into the land, but that I can't? Is this paying me what I deserve for all the work that I did? And God said, but if you don't die, how will I be able to resurrect you? And resurrection, trias hamesim, is the ultimate goodness, the ultimate life. So how can I bring you ultimate life if we don't discontinue this life? So Moshe said, but the commandment is that you have to pay the worker on the day that he works. This world, this life is called day, and the world to come is called tomorrow. So Moshe argued that you're promising to pay me tomorrow, but the commandment is that you have to pay me today, in this life. Moshe was saying, life on earth is more precious than life in heaven. And Moshe was not interested, didn't desire reward for the, the for his service of God. What he really wanted was to remain alive so that he can continue to serve. He would rather work and and serve God than be paid and rewarded for the work that he had already done. God said to him, enough already. In the simple, literal meaning, enough already means... There is no point in going on with your prayers because the decree has already been made and and you have to pass away. But on a deeper level, interesting uh, uh, insight, the commandment to pay a worker on the same day that he works 
applies to a worker who is poor. Because he depends on the day's payment for a pillow for his head or a meal before he goes to sleep, therefore you must pay him before the day is done so that he can have a peaceful night, a comfortable night. But if the worker is not poor, then this commandment that you have to pay him the day that he works does not apply at all. So what God was saying to to Moshe was, enough already, meaning not you've spoken enough, you've pleaded enough, but that you have enough, you're not poor. The commandment that you're complaining about, you demand that I pay you on the day that you work, that doesn't apply to you because you are not poor. Moshe was saying, going into the Holy Land and being able to do the commandments that can only be performed in Eretz Yisrael is crucial to his life. He can't live without it because he he has nothing else. He is poor. So he presented his prayers like a, like a, like a poor man pleading for, for the most basic necessities of life. And that's how Moshe felt. That if he can't do the mitzvahs, all of them, including the ones that can be performed only in the land of Israel, then he has nothing at all. And that is a measure of his humility a measure of Moshe's greatness in that he felt that at that point in his life, at 120 years old and having accomplished many great things, as he himself will soon describe, yet he felt that all of that was nothing and that going into the land and being able to perform those mitzvahs, that was everything for him. And so he pleaded like a poor man. And God's response to him was, you are very humble, but you are not poor. You are very rich in mitzvahs and in godliness and in holiness and so on. The Medrash gives another explanation as to why the blessing had to come from Moshe. It lists Moshe's virtues. And one of those virtues is that he is... Bar Levov, he is innocent of heart. Moshe was innocent of heart. And those who are innocent of heart, their blessings are always fulfilled, are always effective. And that's why Moshe blessed the people. Where do we see that Moshe was innocent of heart? So the Medrash tells us of an interesting conversation that Moshe had with God when the Jews made the golden calf. The Medrash says that Moshe, in his innocence, in his sincerity, was able to say things to God that would otherwise be considered disrespectful, blasphemous, even if a person would say it to a human king, much less to God himself. Because when God was angry, that the Jews made the golden calf, Moshe pleaded for their forgiveness. And among other things, Moshe said, Why, God, are you angry at your people? And God said, Why am I angry? Forty days ago, at the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai, I said to them, You shall have no graven images. And now, only forty days later, They've made a golden calf, and they're bowing to it. So Moshe said, but shouldn't shouldn't a person express gratitude for everything that they get in life? And isn't milk that the cow gives, isn't that something that we should be grateful for? So why is it so wrong for the Jews to be expressing their gratitude and their appreciation to the cow for the milk that it gives. So God said to Moshe, are you making the same mistake? You too? Cows don't give milk. I create the cow. I create the milk. It all comes from me. The cow is merely a tool 
The cow does nothing. The cow is nothing. And so Moshe said, in that case, what are you angry about? Then why are you angry at the people for bowing to nothing? And God forgave them. So the Medrash is saying that if anyone else had said, had, had, uh, used such an argument, even with a human king, he would have forfeited his life. But Moshe, in his utter sincerity and absolute innocence of heart, was not being shrewd or, or, or leading the conversation where he wanted it to go. He was absolutely sincere at every, at every part of that conversation. It wasn't shrewdness, it was innocence. And incidentally, this is true of all uh, stories that we hear about tzaddikim, which sometimes give the impression that the tzaddik was playing a psychological game, that he was being shrewd, that he was manipulating a conversation, which cannot be true because tzaddikim are innocent of heart and they're not capable and they are certainly not given to such psychological games. Just as an example, there's a story with Rebbe Yitzchak of Bardichev, the Bardichever, who was both a, uh, a Rebbe and a rabbi, a Rav, so he would uh, he would deal with legal questions, with uh, civil suits, and he was also the tzaddik, the rebbe of his congregation, of his town. Uh, one day, a man came to the Bardichera, and he cried his heart out because he had to marry off a daughter, and he had no money for the wedding. And his wealthy brother uh, was angry at him, and he couldn't approach him for help with the wedding, so he had no place to uh, to turn to, no one to turn to for help with the wedding. So the Radhichara said, "Your brother won't help you out with the wedding. Tell him to come to me. I'll speak to him." And so he goes and he tells his brother that the Radhichara, the Rebbe wants to see him. This wealthy brother was a very uh, busy man. He was running a big factory and he was uh, involved in many in many projects. But when he heard that the Rebbe was calling, of course, out of respect, he went to the Bardichev. He came into the room and he finds the Bardichev studying with great enthusiasm out loud a uh, page of Talmud, of Gemara. The wealthy man didn't know what to do. Should he interrupt and announce his presence? Should he wait until the Baditcher was finished? He had a business to attend to. He had to get back to to, to the factory. But he waited respectfully. The Baditcher didn't seem to be uh, finishing. Kept on learning with great enthusiasm. Finally, this wealthy man who... uh, had all the pressures of the business weighing on him, couldn't couldn't wait any longer. And he uh, coughed and interrupted and said, Excuse me, Rebbe, you sent for me? The Baditcher looked up and said, Oh, yes, yes, I did. Thank you for coming. And then went back to studying. A while goes by and this man doesn't under, he doesn't know what to do. So he finally interrupts again, and he says, Rebbe, is there something special? And the Baditchava said, yes, today is for me a very special day, because today I can fulfill a mitzvah that I don't otherwise fulfill. So the man said, and and what is that? And the Baditchava said, there's a, there's a, a statement in the Mishnah that says, 
that just as it is a mitzvah to tell someone, to encourage someone to be good, when that encouragement will be heard, there is also a mitzvah not to say, not to try to encourage someone if the encouragement won't help, it won't be heard. And generally, the Rebbe said, when I speak to people, it's effective. So I don't, I don't have an opportunity, I haven't had the opportunity to not say what won't be effective because it's usually effective. But today, I have the mitzvah, I am fulfilling the mitzvah of not saying what won't be heard. The man understood that the Baditcha was referring to him, and he said, Rebbe, if you tell me something, of course I'll do it. So the Baditcha said, Is that so? You will do it. Well then, in that case, why won't you help your brother with his wedding? So the man said, Fine, I'll help him. And he gave him all the money for his wedding. Now when you hear the story, or the way the story is sometimes told, it really makes the impression that the Bardicheva was leading him, that this was all some kind of a, a ploy, it was, it was a play acting, he was, he, was, uh, he was entrapping him by, by what he was doing and what he was saying. But anybody who knew the Bardicheva, and the same is true with any tzaddik, would know immediately that such a thing wasn't possible at all. The Bardicheva would never mislead, he would never play a role he was completely innocent of heart. And therefore, when the, when the poor brother came and said, my rich brother won't help me, the Badicheva felt obligated to try to help. So he said, send your brother to me. But then the Badicheva knew that the brother was very, was very angry and stingy and would not help, and so he didn't say anything. What could he say? But when the brother asked him what's special today, he told him what was special. And when the rich brother said, but I will help, the Badicheva was genuinely surprised, pleasantly surprised, and said, in that case, go ahead and help him. So it was all done with absolute innocence, and it all worked out right, because, because of the innocence, not because of the shrewdness or the game-playing. And so it was with Moshe, that Moshe was innocent of heart, and those who are innocent of heart, their blessings are effective, and that's why, v'zeis habracha, that's why Moshe gave the blessing. We find in the passing away of another tzaddik in Torah, we, f- we find a description of the passing away of Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet. The Torah says that on the day that he was supposed to pass away, He went out into the field, accompanied by his disciple, the prophet Elisha. And as Elisha watched, a fiery chariot came down from heaven, and Eliyahu stepped onto the chariot, and the chariot carried him off into heaven. And this is what what is meant when the Gemara says that Eliyahu did not die. It means that death usually implies the separation of body and soul, whereas in the case of Eliyahu, his body accompanied his soul to heaven. So although he was taken from earth, but he didn't die in the sense of separation of the body from the soul, because his body had become so holy, so purified, so completely merged, with the soul, that his body literally became soulful. It became part of his soul and went to heaven with the soul. In the case of Moshe, we find the opposite. We find that Moshe's soul became somewhat like his body, became attached and merged with the body. The Medrash puts it this way. When the time came for Moshe to pass away, God called to the angel Michoel and said, Go bring me Moshe's neshama, the soul of Moshe. The angel Michoel said, 
I was his teacher and he was my student. How could I possibly take his soul from him? So God turned to the angel Gavriel and he said, Gavriel, go bring me Moshe's soul. And Gavriel said, but he is as great as all 600,000 souls put together. How could I possibly take his soul? So God turned to the angel of death and said, go bring me Moshe's soul. The angel of death wrapped himself in anger and girded himself with, with cruelty and he went to take Moshe's soul. When he approached Moshe and found him writing the name of God, he was frightened, he trembled. And he couldn't approach Moshe. We find the same uh, the same kind of an event concerning David, David Amelach, that when a date when a time came for him to pass away, knowing that he would pass away on a Shabbos, he spent the entire day studying Torah and the angel of death could not approach him. So in order to take his soul, the angel of death had to distract him from his study. And only when he was distracted and interrupted for a brief moment his study of Torah, only then could the angel of death take his soul. What could possibly distract David from the study of Torah? The angel of death caused a sound, created a sound outside his window that sounded like a woman in trouble. So David came to help. Of course, there was no one in trouble, so his interruption was in vain, and and that interruption was enough to give the angel of death access to, uh, to David. So here, when the angel of death came to Moshe and saw that he was writing God's name and his face was shining like the sun, he, he couldn't approach him. Moshe saw the angel of death and said to him, what are you doing here? He said, I came to take your soul. So Moshe said, you're not going to take my... Who sent you? So he said, the creator of all souls sent me. So Moshe said, you're not going to take my soul. The angel of death said, and what is so special about you? What makes you the exception? I take everyone's soul. So Moshe said, I am an exception. I am the son of Amram. I was born circumcised. When I was born, I spoke and I walked and I prophesied and I told my parents that I would receive the Torah in a flame of fire on the, on, on the top of Mount Sinai. And then I went out into the palace and I took the crown off Pharaoh's head. And then when I was 80, I made my way up to heaven and I brought the Torah down to earth. And while in Egypt I created and performed all sorts of plagues and wonders and miracles and I split the sea, and then I waged war with the giants and I defeated them, So is there anyone else like me? You are not going to take my soul. The angel of death fled. God said to him, again, bring me Moshe's soul. So the angel drew his sword and again approached Moshe. But Moshe said to God, Master of the universe, remember when you revealed yourself to me in the burning bush? Remember when I spent 40 days and 40 nights with you on the mountain? Do me a favor. Don't send me this angel of death. 
And God said, you're right. I will not send you the angel of death. I will take care of your demise and, and burial myself. And why did Moshe deserve to have God take care of his burial? It's because when it came time for the Jews to leave Egypt, they were all told to gather gold and silver so that they can fulfill the prophecy that God promised to Avraham that when his grandchildren will leave the land of their oppression, they will leave with a great wealth. And so they were gathering gold and silver and loading it on their donkeys. What was Moshe doing at that time? Moshe was running around the city looking for the casket containing the body of Yosef. Because before Yosef passed away, he made his children, his brothers and his children, swear that when God comes to redeem them, and to take them out of Egypt, they should not forget to take his body with them. And so they couldn't leave without finding Yosef's body. So Moshe was running around the city three days and three nights without rest, looking for Yosef's casket. And he couldn't find. Till finally, he met this ancient woman who was Serach, the daughter of Usher. Yaakov's granddaughter, who with her music and her, her harp uh, broke the news to Yaakov that Yosef was still alive. And she lived a very long life. So she was, she was still alive when the, when the Jews left Egypt. So Moshe met her, and she noticed that Moshe was exhausted, and she said, what's the problem? And he said, for three days and three nights... I'm running around looking for Yosef's body and I can't find it. So she said, come, I'll show you where the Egyptians hid his casket. She took him to the edge of the water of the Nile and she says, here in this spot, the Egyptians built a casket weighing 500 pounds and they put Yosef in it and they dropped it to the bottom of the river because they knew that the Jews wouldn't be able to leave Egypt without Yosef's body and they wanted to keep the Jews there permanently. And so they made it impossible to get to Yosef's body. Moshe went to the edge of the water and he called to Yosef and he said, Yosef, you have many virtues to your credit. Use your credit and ask God to bring you up to the surface. And immediately the casket weighing 500 pounds floated to the surface like a cork. Moshe took the casket and carried it on his shoulders all the way to Israel. At that time, God said to him, you may think that this is an insignificant mitzvah that you're, that you're performing, but I swear to you that in merit, in, the, in reward for what you're doing for Yosef, I will do the same for you. I will take care of your burial. Finally, when all the angels had failed and were unable to bring Moshe's neshama, God himself came to Moshe and said to the neshama, My daughter, come, leave Moshe's body and come with me to heaven. And Moshe's soul said, But I don't want to leave the body. The soul said, Master of the universe, I know that you are the master of all souls. You created me, you formed me, and you breathed me into Moshe's body. But has there ever been a holier body than Moshe? I love, I love him. I want to stay here. So God said, My daughter, come. I will raise you up to the heaven of heavens. And I will seat you next to the holiest of angels and the seraphim, next to my throne. And the soul said, those angels, they came down to earth once, the fallen angels, and they were immediately corrupted 
by earth and lost their holiness. But Moshe has never lost his holiness. I don't want to go. So we see that where Eliyahu's body had become part of his soul and could not be separated from the soul and went with the soul to heaven, here we see that Moshe's soul had become so attached to his body that it didn't want to leave the body. So there are different kinds of godliness and different kinds of tzaddikim. Moshe's soul had become attached to the holiness of his body. Which also explains why Moshe pleaded 515 times to stay on earth. Because to Moshe, the body and the mitzvahs that the body can perform were much greater and much more precious than the holiness of the soul and the reward that it would receive in heaven. So finally God came down and told Moshe to prepare himself to die. And three angels accompanied God, the angel Michoel, the angel Gavriel, and the angel Zagzagiel. Michoel was on the right side, stood on the right side, and Gavriel on the left side, and uh, Zagzagiel at his feet. And God kissed Moshe, and in the kiss took his soul. At that time, the world trembled and thought that history was ending, that the end of time had come. And the angels cried, and they said, the righteous among men is no longer. The people cried, And they said, It is he who taught us righteousness. And God cried and said, Who will argue with me on behalf of the wicked? Who will stand up against me in defense of the sinners? So we see that the world itself thought it was ending because of the loss of a tzaddik. The people felt the loss in that the tzaddik is the one who influences the godliness and the goodness and the holiness in the people. And God cried because God had lost something very precious to him. Not a loyal servant, not a holy uh, person, not a great student, what bothered God the most is that there was no longer someone on earth who could argue on behalf of the sinner. So God cried and said, who will stand against me on behalf of, on behalf of the wicked? We find when uh, when Moshe was pleading on behalf of the Jewish people when they had sinned, where Moshe says, if you forgive them, and if you don't, erase me from your book. Moshe put his own existence on the line and said, if they're not forgiven, I don't want to exist at all. Now, in the, in the verse, in the Pesach itself, there seems to be a word missing. Moshe said, if you forgive them, and if not, erase me from your book. So the literal uh, literal, uh, understanding, the way it's it's read and, and, and interpreted, is that Moshe said, if you forgive them, that's okay, then it's fine, but if you don't, then erase me from your book. The Rebbe's father I believe Yitzchak Schneerson gave a deeper 
and richer interpretation. He said, Moshe was actually saying, if you forgive them, and if you don't forgive them, either way, erase me from your book. Because when God came to Moshe and said, the the Jews have sinned, and I'm going to destroy them, Moshe said, but you promised Avraham, their grandfather, that they will be uh, an eternal people, that they will always be Jews. So God said, I will fulfill that promise by giving you many children. So I will rebuild the Jewish people from you, but everybody else will be killed. When Moshe heard this, he said, in that case, whether you forgive them or not, erase me from your book. Because the fact that God could even consider destroying the people is based on keeping his promise by giving Moshe children. Which means that Moshe's existence is what was making it possible for God to even consider destroying the Jews. To this, Moshe said, in that case, I don't want to exist at all. I don't want to be the cause, even indirectly, of anything negative that might come to the Jewish people. In fact, that's why Moshe hit the rock. When God said, speak to the rock, Moshe chose to hit the rock, even though he knew that that meant that he would not be allowed to go into Israel. He hit the rock because speaking to the rock might reflect badly on the Jewish people because they're spoken to and they don't always listen. And if he speaks to the rock and the rock does obey, it might be held against the people that rocks listen and speaking to you is worse than speaking to a rock. So Moshe felt, I I have to protect the people even at personal expense. And so he spo- he hit the rock instead of speaking to the rock, all because he was defending people who had sinned in some very serious ways. And God appreciated that more than anything else. Because even when God is angry at the people, he wants everybody else to be protective and to defend the people no matter what the sins are.